Welcome everyone to this evening's session. This is the latest in our collaboration that is between the Moore Institute, the Galway Archaeological and Historical Society, and the School of History and Philosophy at NUI Galway. Uh, my name is Daniel Carey. I'm director of the Moore Institute. Uh, delighted, as I say, to welcome you here. Uh, I've been working with David Kelly on this session. David is running uh, affairs behind the, uh, behind the scenes. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to doc Dr. Jackie Akina, who is editor of the Society's Journal and indeed my, my colleague at NUI Galway. So Jackie, over to you. Hi, Dan. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, um, you're very welcome, everybody. Um, uh, I'm Dr. Jackie Ichana, and as Dan says, I'm a colleague of, of, of both himself in the Moore Institute, but also our speaker tonight, uh, Dr. Sarah Ann Buckley. Um, and I'm just before I introduce Dr. Buckley, I just wanted to say again a thank you to Dan Carey and everybody at NUIG and the Moore Institute for working with the Gawi Archaeological and Historical Society in facilitating this, um, <clears throat> excuse me, online lecture this evening. Um, it's been difficult for us to keep going with the lectures given the, the COVID situation, but it would have been almost impossible if it hadn't been for the cooperation of Professor Carey, the Moore, and David Kelly, who has facilitated this. So our sincere thanks to all of them. Um, now, so our lecture this evening is given by a colleague, and I'd like to say friend of mine as well, uh, Dr. Sarah Ann Buckley. Um, Sarah Ann Buckley is um, a lecturer in history at, at uh, NUI Galway. Um, she's chair of the Irish History Students Association. She's co-principal investigation, uh, sorry, and principal investigator of the tomb oral history project and a senior research fellow at the UNESCO Child and Family Research Centre. Um, she's authored a number of books and articles and will be very well known to many of you for her, her, her the wonderful books that herself and her colleague John Breslin at NUIG uh, produced Old Ireland in Colour 1 and 2, massive successes. Um, but today, I suppose she or this evening, she's coming back to her, her, her key area of, of study, which is in the history of childhood. Um, that's why I know this is going to be a fantastic lecture because she's done so many years work and research on this topic and she is very much an acknowledged expert in it. So I'm not going to delay any longer. I'm going to hand you over to Dr. Buckley, who will be talking to us about the um, providing for the physical, mental and spiritual well-being of the children, uh, childhood in the Irish Free State. So thank you, Sarah Ann, over to you. Thanks, Jackie. <laughs> um, I'm going to share my screen like yeah and I'm sick I can do my thank yous then am I all good David and Jackie yeah everyone can see that so um before I start uh to thank Jackie and and Dan from the Moor and David Kelly and um I suppose when when Shane O'Diver, or Diver as we know, asked me to do this talk, um, I initially was a bit unsure because I wanted it to be very relevant to the Civil War and to the Irish Free State. And I suppose one of the things that's quite interesting about the history of childhood and youth in comparison to maybe uh, pol some political history or economic history is that it's really still developing. So we do have these like broad surveys or we have, you know, fantastic work in in youth culture and in child welfare, a certain amount in education. Um, but we're still really expanding uh, the area. So part of what I'll be doing tonight is actually pointing out where I think there can be more research and I suppose giving pathways to, to where that can uh, can come from. Um, the image here, as Jackie said, not to flog my own book, or yes to, is actually from Old Ireland and Colour too, but I chose it, it's um, it's in Limerick, it's the Treaty Stone, and it's from 1903. Um, and I suppose one of the things I was thinking about the last few days when I was thinking about this talk is, um, we had a lot of discussion in women's history about, you know, did we hit 1921, 22, and women were treated differently then uh, than they were in 1918, 1919? And I think when you're looking at a topic like childhood, uh, gender history, 
Um, I obviously I'm going to keep this talk in the Irish Free State, but it's part of a, a broader narrative. And uh, I just to, I suppose keep that in mind as we as we go through. Um, so before one of the, the things I'm going to have to say as a historian of childhood, um, we're a little bit obsessed with where can we get the voices of children uh, and younger people, um, particularly those who perhaps did not come in contact with, you know, education or with, I guess, other arms of the state. Where do we find them in the archive? Where do we find them in the official history? So we're a little bit obsessed with that. And we're also a little bit obsessed with what Harry Hendrick has uh, talked about, which is how do we make sure that this is not just about what adults have done to children, but actually how children experienced life in, in certain circumstances. And it's not that we do that all the time, but we really try when we're looking at the variety of sources and digging into different places to have that in mind. I just have a little image here of um, the uh, bibliography of Irish childhood or the history of Irish childhood bibliography. And I, I just have it up there, the link, because um, it was part of a project that a conference, it was, God, it was 2014 now that we ran a group of us that were working in the area. And as a result, um, Dr. Mary Hatfield still runs this uh, bibliography where she adds all the new work that's anyway related to children or youth or um, and it's an amazing resource. And I really just want to highlight it because it, it, as we, you know, for students, for for scholars from different areas, um, if we can integrate or look through the lens of children and younger people more, I think we're going to learn a lot more about 1920s, 1930s, 1940s Ireland, as well as about the history of, of children and, and younger people. So another thing I have to say before I get into the meat of the talk, um, we always today, as in the past, need to look at what has affected the life of a child, okay, and their experience. And it's it's obvious enough, but it's their social class, their gender, their ethnicity, their race, their age is really important um, because we know that at different times that, you know, are in different time periods, a nine year old's life is very different, uh, say, in 1810 than it is in the 1920s, um, particularly if they're from uh, a lower social class. So we're really a bit obsessed with age as well as uh, with the voice and and with the kind of, you know, how children actually portrayed or saw their lives. So a nod to the sources and then what I'm going to look at today. I'm not going to keep people past 40 minutes, I promise. I'd like lots of time for questions and please put them in the Q&A as I go through. Um, so a lot of the probably... Uh, the departmental records, the kind of state records, we can find children in there. And I'll be talking to that today. But we do have some other really big collections that um, I think are really worth looking at. Obviously, newspapers, um, uh, and especially since they've been digitized, but all the problems with that are a way that we can find some really interesting um, aspects of, of children's lives but a lot of you would have heard of the folklore collection before and their schools collection is you know an amazing it was an amazing project in the 1930s but for historians um using it even given the fact that teachers and adults were quite involved in how it was curated um using it is an absolute pleasure and one of the things i'll be advocating today is that we need a lot more local histories and we need a lot more micro histories of childhood and of children and you know the schools collection is an amazing place to start um particularly when we're looking at you know hobbies games local folklore how children viewed their local area it's just it's a really unusual source internationally um, and hopefully one that to some extent we might repeat in this country in regards to talking to children or having children talk about how their lives are today for future generations. Um, obviously photographs, we also have a huge collection of like Irish women writers and children's fiction and to be honest there's a far more developed literature on ch or 
scholarship on children's literature than there is on children's history. And we've been kind of catching up with our colleagues um, in that way. So I'm going to start with um, the state, <clears throat> A, because it's my area, and B, because I think that's where we're going to see how changes occurred for children and younger people um, in the 20s and 30s in particular. And a lot of what I'm going to look at is and talk about is health, welfare. Um, and then I'm going to talk about work and how the working lives of younger people and children had changed, how school comes into that, and also how play did. Um, and I'm going to talk briefly about the idea of the public child, as Robbie Gilligan has stated or, or called it. So the child that is actually um, or should be under the state's care and then the private child, and which is the majority of children in the country um, at that time. Until the 1950s, Ireland was primarily rural, as many of you know. So the difference is there and also um, throughout, I'm going to try and just keep us focused on how uh, the larger political and social and economic context could have affected um, the lives of, of children. And the big question is, and again, we're obsessed with this, is it a story of progress? Can we even map that or chart that? Um, and that's something that, again, historians of childhood are grappling with, that um, was childhood for the majority of children a better experience at the end of this period or at the beginning? So that is what I hope to do. Um, as I said at the start, it's not that the focus on children and younger people was new. If we look at the revolution, and I've been doing some work on this recently because I'm very lucky that myself and, and actually Jackie are putting together and will be looking for contributions on an anthology of childhood and youth, which is going to be a very big undertaking and happy to talk about in the questions. Um, but you've probably heard at some point in the last 10 years, um, the quote from the 1916 proclamation, cherishing all of the children of the nation equally, which as many scholars, not just historians of childhood have pointed out, was not directly referring to children, but to all citizens. But I think what it does emphasize, and the title of this talk, which is a quote taken from uh, the democratic program of the first doll, that the focus on children and particularly the focus on children as the future of a new state of the Irish Republic was not a, a, a new thing. And it was also something that if we're looking at how children have been used and focused on by by other movements internationally, you know, this idea of children as the future, which develops and saving the souls of children in the 19th century. And we see a lot of that discourse. Um, which some of it's from philanthropists, but it's also coming from the state. Um, there's a big focus on children and younger people in Ireland in the years prior to independence. Um, work on the Fireside Club, the Patriotics Children's Street. As we know, the 1913 lockout, children and the kiddie scheme were a big feature of that. Uh, Schoolboy strikes. But even when we get to the Civil War, or sorry, to the War of Independence, a lot of the men that are involved are, are young men. They're under the age of 25, which, which was what was defined as youth. Um, we still have the involvement of children who are members of Nafina Aaron. Um, and later on, and Gavin Foster has written about this uh, after the Civil War, that there is a lot of pro-treaty discourse, I suppose in some ways, um, describing Republicans as immature, as using their youth against them. So I think this trope or this idea of youth uh, is kind of really interesting. And there, Marnie Hay has done excellent work in this area, but there's definitely more that could be done there. Um, and maybe one of the questions, and I talked to my students about this, when we used to sit in rooms together is, you know, was it ever really acceptable for um, children to be involved in these conflicts. So if we think about uh, Joe Duffy's book, when he, you know, the 40 children he, he looked at who died during Easter week, or as I say, if we look at Nafina Aaron and these other groups, it's interesting to think about, you know, today, would we be comfortable with 
you know, Mary Bowles in Cork, who was 15, carrying firearms in, in if, if there's a similar scenario. So I think some of these are kind of interesting things to think about. Um, as I said, I, I took the title from of this talk from the Democratic Programme of the First All, which, you know, we can go into the how it was put together, the small number of individuals involved, but as a template, if you want that, for a new state um, to, to make it the first duty to provide for the physical, mental and spiritual well-being of children is, is an interesting um, idea. And uh, I think it's one that when we look at debates in the doll in particular in the 20s and 30s, um, it's interesting to search and just see how often children are being referenced. And as I said, there is this focus in particular on education and on the training of this, this next generation. And that's really where I wanted to, to begin this. Um, I'm going to look first at what the state did look at, what it did focus on. Um, uh, as you can see here, obviously, what, what's in red is really what occurred um, just before independence or in the, the early uh, years. But throughout the 19th century, the long 19th century, as many of us know, and luckily we've lots of archival evidence for this, there is an increasing focus on becoming involved in the private family and um, particularly becoming involved in the lives of those who are poorer or those in uh, in the working class. So we are we are seeing this. Um, there's almost 50 pieces of legislation um, that culminate in the 1908 Children's Act. But um, after independence, there is more of a focus on, again, school attendance, um, the Public Health or Medical Treatment Act. There's discussions of and in some ways, a lot of my work in the, the earlier years of my career was looking at how families were being, I suppose, watched or there was some surveillance there, often with good with, with good measure, as there were conditions in certain houses that, that weren't for the well-being of children. But it's interesting that that's where the focus is in the early years. I always highlight the School Attendance Act because a very benign in some ways, um, um, I suppose, piece of legislation, but uh, compulsory legislation had been introduced at the end of the 19th century. The School Attendance Act was more the stick than the carrot when it came to um, having children uh, attend school to the age of 14. And I suppose where it fit into my work over the years and where I think a lot more needs to be done is after, usually after three warnings, um, a, a child could be sent to an industrial school if they were not attending school. And Tony Fahey's work in particular has looked at this, how many prosecutions there were of parents and how many committals to industrial schools there were as a result of this act. And later on, in conjunction with the 1941 uh, Children's Act. So uh, an act that obviously is trying to encourage the education of children perhaps is not looking at why children are not attending school. And um, you shouldn't give personal stories when you're giving talks, but um, my, my grandfather in Dublin actually was sent to let a frack as a result of this legislation, which I wouldn't have known. Um, I wouldn't have known uh, when I was researching years ago, but like in many cases, you had elder children in the family whose income was needed um, and therefore they couldn't attend school till 14. So it's this tension at times between school, work, the family economy and where the state fits into that. And I think that's really, that has been something that I'm still very interested in in my work. Um, the Illegitimate Children Affiliations Order Act and the Legitimacy Act very much focused on uh, children born to women who weren't married and then the question of maintenance and how that maintenance could be pursued. So something that's been quite topical when we're looking at um, the mother and baby institutions and other institutions 
And similarly, the registration of Maternity Homes Act is quite central there. So the state is actually getting involved in people's lives in this way. Um, the last piece I'll mention is the children's allowances, which a lot of you may know about and you may know the details of it, but it's always interested me when I read the debates leading up to them, they tell you quite a lot about how ministers, politicians at the time, A, were looking to Britain, which many were, they were looking to the beverage report, they were looking to what was occurring across the water, um, but also the importance of the family. And obviously the 1937 constitution, the family is, is you know, put center stage in that. Um, but one of the things that interests me with the debates on children's allowances is that, you know, it's the third child upwards. They're given to fathers, not to mothers. Um, and in the debates, what you see is a real, I suppose, need or a wish by many of those to ensure that father's place in the home as breadwinner was not superseded. So suggestions that it be called a family allowance were very quickly dismissed. Um, and it was very much to be, uh, you know, not to supersede the role of fathers. And, you know, the you know, work of people like Lindsay Erna Byrne has talked about this, how there's a certain type of family that's being um, endorsed. Now, the rest of the legislation here is a lot of, I suppose, the concerns later on around youth in particular. And I mentioned at the end um, uh, how much concern there was about youth, modernity, discussions of delinquency. Um, modernity is an obvious concern, the cinema, uh, cars, all of these symbols of uh, a different type of Ireland perhaps than, than was being uh, endorsed at the time. Um, a quick mention on, on where I think there could be more work in school, but also some of the work I've been doing recently. Um, as many of you know, Ireland, you know, literacy was very high in Ireland by the end of the 19th century. And there certainly is an interest in, in learning and in and culture. Um, I've mentioned already how compulsory education could have some negative effects. It obviously had hugely positive effects as well in how it opened up and it widened class boundaries. And this goes far past 1949 when we're talking about this. Um, two of the topics that I've looked at, because I think they kind of tell a lot about not the everyday school experience, which I think we can take a lot from memoir and we can take a lot from oral histories and we can take a lot from looking at the curriculum at the time, the textbooks, that work is really, really interesting in the history of education. But I have looked at the phenomenon of school strikes, which um, I didn't expect there to be many of, but I have been kind of building up a large number of examples over the past few years. And, you know, I was looking particularly at the West of Ireland um, and looking at the issues that were coming up there. And some of them you'd expect um, the provision of school meals or the lack of in certain areas. Um, questions around, again, resources, um, very big issues in certain local areas, which people may not be surprised at if someone was hired and a new teacher who either wasn't acceptable or wasn't the person that um, had been expected to take the role or where nepotism was involved. You often actually had, um, in some ways, uh, students in solidarity with the rest of the staff striking. Um, and then probably more unusual, there were one or two examples where students had cited excessive uh, corporal punishment. And this was prior to the 1950s when that issue had really begun to grow. This is in the 20s and the 30s. And I think there, there, it's obviously the tip of the iceberg. It's a small number of cases, but it shows that there was some transgression there um, and that students were actually questioning whether uh, the use of, of this punishment was acceptable. Um, 
so these are some of the, the ones that I'm looking at at the moment. Um, I've looked at them internationally as well. There weren't the demands there were in, uh, I've looked at a few cases in Texas where they're looking for shorter school days or they're looking for, you know, a lot more, their demands were a lot greater than what uh, the students were looking for in Ireland in the 20s and 30s. Um, now the topic of corporal punishment, there's an excellent um, article on this by Moira McGuire and Shame So Canada. Uh, a good beating never hurt anyone. Um, but I think a lot of people would be surprised that there were rules and regulations uh, for corporal punishment. And you, you know, there was, it was very defined, a set number of, um, you know, slaps on the wrist. I think when I say this sometimes with a, a certain group of people or people of a certain age, there is a, an uncomfortable laugh because they, the other piece of the rules and regulations was actually that you know students should not be punishment punished for not knowing their lessons so for not actually um being able to kind of know their work and I think it's really interesting that most people I've spoken to uh that is exactly why they were being punished so I think there's a lot you know more that we could benefit from particularly in regard to oral history there um, but I think it's also one that crosses into trauma for a lot of people. So um, I'm not sure if it's something that we will collect as soon as we should. Um, on that question of oral history, there are certainly parts of school life that will be outside of uh, some of the archival sources. So I think that oral history is a really big part to play there, especially around, and you, I, I don't know, can you see the quote at the, the top of the screen, that school was um, a stage for the enactment of class. We can see in a number of memoirs that, you know, the first day of school always seems to feature, but also, you know, there's a discussion of that hierarchy of students within the class where they sat, how they were treated by the, the teacher. There's a lot now, I suppose, being discussed in regards to the history of how children from the traveling community have been treated in schools or other groups that, you know, similarly, when we look at children who were placed in institutions and how they were treated when they were in school. So I think there's, there's interesting to look at the classroom in that way as well. Um, this is a letter from, I was thinking about the political context and uh, the school strikes. This is this is the letter that I've, I've given a paper on this a few years ago in Cambridge, but um, from T.P. Gunning, the General Secretary of the League of Youth. And uh, I'll read it out just in case um, anyone can see it. As you are aware, in one or two instances recently, strikes have been organised in national schools, which are attended by children of our supporters wearing blue shirts. Well, we must take that and that these young members of our organization are entitled to wear their emblems in school if they so wish. And in fact, they are to be commended for displaying such zeal and enthusiasm. It is the special wish of the Director General that politics should not be allowed to interrupt schoolwork. Now, I think this is quite interesting because, and I won't be able to go into it in the talk, but there has been um, more research coming through on, on youth culture and gangs and kind of urban youth and then we also have a lot of youth movements so I think that this is an area that hopefully we'll have a bit more research on and especially in the 1930s where and um, these issues are are kind of really relevant and really prevalent and um, in regards to work I'm not going to spend long in this the main I suppose the main point I wanted to make when we're looking at how legislation curtailing children working began to come in from the end of the 19th century. Um, it's, I, I think we need to look at the 20s and 30s sometimes from the lens of, you know, as I said, the family, what type of family is being promoted? Who is the breadwinner? Who, who gets to contribute to that family? What are the other roles? And, you know, a lot of the legislation that focused on women, say, in the 1920s and 30s was about curtailing their role as, as has been very well um, demonstrated um, by historians in that space. To me, a, a large part of that is a real concern with male unemployment and obviously with wages and with, you know, all these issues that, you know, women and children were paid less. They 
they are paid less today. Um, but I think there is a, a way that we could look at this. We could look at the question of children and work and school and also look at it from, from that view. Um, and that's not to say that I think that children should have to work. It's more a question of many children and younger people were working and they needed to work. And, you know, there's a culture shift when legislation is introduced and people are expected to just straight away adapt to it, there are these lulls and these, these numbers of decades at times where, you know, families can't react that quickly. Um, so the different types of work um, and the fact that, as I say, by 1920, the employment of under 15s in workshops and factories had been for the most part eliminated. Now, whether you were truthful about your age, is a whole other question with a lot of these uh, issues. For young girls, looking after younger children, working on the farm, if in a rural area or in a in a in an urban area, having to stay at home. And um, there's some really good work on, you know, the young mammies in Dublin in particular, as they were known. Um, the hiring fair, now this is a quote from the end of the 19th century, but it still has a, presence in the 30s and 40s, as many of you may be aware, um, particularly in, in Donegal. And, you know, I've interviewed uh, two gentlemen who were hired out in the 1940s and had very, very, very varied experiences. And, you know, we have some accounts in memoir of this as well and discussion again in the folklore collection. But I think it's something we shouldn't leave out of this this conversation. Um, when it comes to play, and it is an area that is getting more and more attention, which is great. And I'm going to plug, if anyone hasn't heard of the Museum of Childhood Ireland project, please do follow them um, because hopefully there will be a physical space at some point for the amazing collections that the, the National Museum of Ireland have. They have thousands of toys, artifacts, you know, uh, you know, photographs from the National Library that can really show future generations what childhood was like, particularly, I suppose, when it comes to um, the question of toys, you know, there's a difference. I've used the example of dolls because they have more um, homemade dolls, um, but they also then have, you know, particularly for those in the middle class or, you know, uh, in the wealthier classes, they have a lot of dolls from France, from the continent. Um, so to be able to see these would be amazing and to, I suppose, bring children today to see that in some ways, a lot of the play, a lot of the games, there's still similarities from, you know, the late 20th century. Um, a lot of the games that we can see, Tip the Can, Roy Rover, um, Hopscotch, um, we know that there's still a really big focus on imitating adults. So maybe today it's not as much giving communion or, you know, it, it's, it's really imitating whatever work that adults are doing. And then we can see like from a lot of uh, the kind of literary works that there's also this obsession with kind of preparing food. And then for people of a kind of younger, of a, more in the teen stage and there was actually by the 1950s teen picks and there was real focus on on teenagers as a group um the cinema and all you know a lot more of the technology that's coming through and in the earlier period books and comics and you know work by um you know Kieran and Neil and how it showed that like particularly the gender for boys certain types of comics may show certain political connotations so there's like really interesting work there, but I suppose the one thing is that I suppose it hasn't changed as much as we think. And historians of childhood are also a bit obsessed with looking at nostalgia and, you know, whether we all think that things were better when we were a child than they are today, which is maybe something we can uh, talk about in the questions. Um, sport, which I know very little about, um, this is, um, uh, Miss Hookie's camogie team in Waterford at the back of Waterford Courthouse in 1915 and the first um, I suppose for like the camogie association is set up in 1904 but it's not till 1932 
that you know they are playing on a, a national stage and I think the involvement and the developments for women in sport is really interesting and some of the letters I was looking at to there's a particular letter to the Irish Examiner where they're looking you know uh, girls and the GA they're looking for support to get more involved and I think um, sport and the increasing time that people younger people had for leisure is really interesting change that increases as we go through the century and um, this is more my area I'm not going to spend too long on it I have my eye on the clock but to obviously point out that by the end of this talk by the 1950s you know the as many people know the population of the Irish Free State in 1956 was 2.6 million or sorry the population of the Irish Republic was 2.6 million Emigration has been a big part of the story of the 20s, 30s and 40s, but poverty is also still a really big part of that story. So this is just one of the examples from my earlier work on the NSPCC of, you know, 10 persons, the parent and eight children were found to be living in one room when the inspector called to see about a boy requiring orthopedic treatment recommended by the school medical officer. So it goes into the living conditions. I suppose the point I wanted to make is, again, the school medical officer, the school attendance officer, there is now more people whose role it is to, I suppose, look at these conditions, to go to families and go into families, not always welcome, but still necessary to a certain extent. Um, also to point out, there was only one laboratory and one water tap. Women's historians and gender historians have gone through this before and pointed out, as have others, but, you know, running water, definitely one of the, I suppose, key um, changes for so many people's lives and, you know, underestimated to some extent, even more so than when electricity becomes more widespread. Um, I just wanted to put up really briefly, I think often we're trying to put in context you know how much people are spending on food on rent and I, it's it's you know obviously discussions that we're we're used to and having today but um I gleaned these from the the uh ISPCC archive um to kind of give myself even a sense of you know who certain pensions outdoor relief home assistance what that means um, widows and orphans pension, you know, how much rent is to give a sense of, you know, where a lot of people are financially in the, this is from the 1930s, primarily uh, these figures, and also just the, the number of people that are living in, in one or two bedroom um, housing. And uh, this is just the cases that, you know, um, were actually investigated. So that was just to kind of bring that to the conversation and then also to just briefly mention when I, we talk about different groups of children and I've mentioned already the school attendance act but obviously again by the 1950s and you know one percent of the population are in institutions in Ireland um children are a large part of that as are our women and and uh I you know there's a lot of focus on that at the moment, but I think we still need to thread it more into our social and political histories um, because 1% of the population is a lot. Um, and the NSPCC admitting in 40s that, you know, to avoid the easy course of committal is always a phrase that I have found very interesting, particularly as these institutions last until much later in the 20th century. Um, and yes, before I sum up on this question of progress, not progress, um, I mentioned that youth is, is, you know, A, it's an area that's really growing, but the first time that the term adolescence is used is the beginning of the 20th century and Stanley Hall coins it and he describes it basically as this time in between childhood and adulthood where you still have some protections but you also are I suppose able to spread your wings um, slightly um, and what we see a lot particularly in 
the parliamentary debates, in sermons, in some of the publications, particularly the Catholic publications, there is a, I would call it a moral panic in the 1930s around adolescence, around this time when there is more freedom. And it's intersecting as well, obviously, with um, fears around modernity and I suppose the, the after effects of, of, and as is often mentioned, the effects of the Great War or the effects of those years around the War of Independence and the Civil War. Um, and the state focuses on, on youth unemployment, it focuses on, on delinquency. And the, this discourse is, is quite prevalent actually at the time. It's quite gendered as well. There's a particular focus on boys or young men as you know needing to be curtailed. They are more the delinquents, women needing to be protected, young women and girls, and their vulnerability being um, highlighted. But it's also there is also some positive side for younger people at this time. And it's, you know, the 40s, 50s in particular, there's a lot more clubs that directed at young women or young men. Um, as many, these are urban and they're rural. Um, Makrana Firma, Minchin Tira, which we are very lucky to have the archive in NUI Galway. Um, and I think looking at these organizations more can tell us a lot and looking at some of the contributions by younger people at the time will give us an understanding more as to how they felt 1930s Ireland was or 1940s Ireland and whether they felt it was an open space or whether, and I haven't even mentioned censorship in this talk, which is the, the big, um, is obviously a huge part of this, um, but whether they felt that there was some, it was it for some, was it perfectly, perfectly happy and was it, you know, and this is the thing sometimes about memoir and about, you know, happy childhood so that often people don't sit down and write down their good experiences. They, they live their lives and, you know, they, they have their families and they have their life course as we talk about. But this question as to, you know, how it was experienced by younger people, I think is something we need to drill down to more and more. Um, and I, there is in the interwar years in particular, a really big concern that maybe, you know, standards and morality had dropped. And, you know, you see this in discussions of sexuality, of, you know, um, sex outside of marriage or before marriage. Um, but this, uh, this article or this piece by Reverend Cannon, it was certain that juvenile delinquency today was definitely on the increase of perfectly appalling depravity, callousness, and almost bestial brutality were before the courts, where the culprits were still in their teens. And in general, young boys and girls just out of school were more inclined since the Great War to run amok. This was more marked in the case of girls. So it's really interesting whether the discourse is being reflected in, in the actual state of, of the country and the lives of, of individuals. Um, progress I the reason sometimes we're looking at such long time periods is that we obviously can chart this more we can look at life expectancy we can look at how long people are in school we can look at the the jobs people have we can look at all of this um it's more difficult in a shorter period to to answer this question but um I yeah I think it's one that I'm going to leave for the the q a if anyone is interested and um just to say thanks again to uh everyone from the more and from uh the society for inviting me and yep very happy to answer any questions now in the q a thanks very much so do I, oh jackie there you are hi how are you sarah and yeah great thank you so much for that that you covered an amazing amount of brand there um, we do have, I'm sure, plenty of questions coming. I have some myself, but I let everybody else in. First of all, there was one question there, Saran. Um, <coughs> excuse yes, me. Yes, I can see. You from can see it there, can you? 
Yeah. And yeah. it relates to masculinity, uh, work and work and employment have been long been associated with masculinity as legislation started removing young boys from the workforce. Did this have any effect on male identity stroke masculine gender expression in those coming of age without access to traditional employment? And did this impact, impact gender roles in any meaningful way? It's a great question. Yes, it is. And masculine, masculinity studies are really just getting off the ground as well. I'm making it seem like all of Irish history, but no, they really are. There's a really great like work by people like Sean Byers, um, uh, Rebecca Barr, and our, previously of our parish, they have an excellent ed edited collection on this. Um, Jennifer Redmond is doing work at the moment. Um, Aidan Beatty's work is fantastic on this. I think that there's two parts to this for me. One, obviously, when you stop someone working at a different age, like you, there is this question, we talk about the extension of childhood a lot. So, you know, that there could be an interview with a nine-year-old in 1870 and they'd say, but I'm not a child, sure, I'm at work this many hours, I'm doing this. And what it is that defines you as a child. So I think there's that piece where they're now moving into you know, they're, they're, when they're not working and when they're in school longer, their childhood is extended. The question around work, like, I think it's really in much focus there was on ensuring, obviously, that, that males are working. And I do think sometimes when we flip that, that discriminatory legislation in the 20s, 30s, and even looking at the gender quota as an in industry, that's a good one for me because you know, that really shows that the focus was on limiting women who were cheaper. So there's, I think it's an interesting way to look at it. And I think it's something that, you know, you want to look at the, le obviously the legislation is discriminatory. We need to highlight that, but we also need to consider why the legislation has been introduced. And it's not just Catholic social teaching. There's lots of other reasons that, you know, this legislation is is being introduced, I think, anyway. Yeah. 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 Thanks, Sarah. And that was great. That was David Gallen's question. Thank you for that, David. And Thanks, Eric. Daniel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> great question. And another great question from Eric Sandweiss. Um, Eric uh, says, to your point, with the moral panic of the 30s, was there any study during or just after the revolution and civil war of how children viewed, endured, or grew out of these traumas? Uh, I'm thinking of Robert Cole's later study in Children of Crisis on the impact of the Troubles, or is this a matter that can only be reconstructed in hindsight? That's a really, really deep question. It is, and I am not going to say that there weren't writings in the 20s and 30s that referenced this, um, but I'm also not going to name them right now, Eric, but I will, I will comment to you. Um, but I do think that what's going on now with the Bureau of Military History witness statements and with the focus on trauma and using them to explore, so be that the question of sexual violence or Marnie Hay is looking more at the question of youth and, and that issue I posed as to, you know, was there a consideration that you have quite young and like Nafina Aaron did it was it was 12 year olds you have them being involved in these in these situations and training like they were being drilled they were being drilled weekly um and while that's part of really why initially young girls were allowed in but then they they changed that because they were actually going to you know fight for the Republic and, and, you know, die for the Republic if necessary. So I think I am, I think that there's definitely kind of work being done on this now, but I think there, there should be a bit more focus on it. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Sarah. And um, Don Kerry um, was looking to ask a question there. Oh, that's okay, Sarah. Hi, Dan. <laughs> really, uh, enjoyed that very much. And there's so many, there's such a richness of, of this topic, and I'm really struck by the richness of the of the sources, the methodology, which obviously combines legal history, political history. Um, I'm sure the dimensions of church history and so on involved. I was kind of interested in 
And to what extent do you approach this or can it be approached through a kind of sociology or even anthropology of, of either childhood or the family in which there would be many aspects, of course. I was thinking partly, this is coming from the outside, you know, the nature of extended families in Ireland is quite distinctive. Um, and, you know, what, how does that, what role does that play as, a, as kind of mediating or, or differentiating force? So I don't know if there's anything in that, that that you think you could, you know, you could comment on. Definitely, like, sociology of childhood is a big part of my, you know, my own reading and work, and we wouldn't be where we are, which is still an early enough stage with the history of childhood, but we wouldn't be there without uh, that work. I think the extended families is definitely very interesting. I didn't get to go into it today, but obviously our weird demographic anomaly by the 1950s where we have this lowest marriage rate in Europe, but we have the incredibly high birth rate, but also because of inheritance practices, we do have a lot of different generations living in, in, in one setting. And, you know, I think that for, for children, and I suppose if we were, again, if they're like, we think about oral history and what people would discuss, for me, one of the factors I didn't put down there, but are, which I think is most critical is where were you in the family? Are you the eldest? Are you the youngest? Are you, you know, there's limited resources to who can be supported, be that earlier in an apprenticeship or in education or in marriage, who, who can, how many women in a family can actually, we can get a dowry for when that is still really an important piece. And some of the work that I found like most interesting the last few years, like there's been really interesting stuff on like breach of promise cases. There's obviously the maintenance stuff is really interesting because, you know, it's before DNA, it's someone's word against someone else's word. It's how a community viewed a couple. So there's the community is so much a part of this as well. Um, and I think, and it was just at a recent talk again about the institutions we were like, and I know the question of respectability has been brought up by a number of our excellent um, historians in the past. And I think that is still so relevant here. Who's respectable and who's not respectable? I often say to the students, there's so many people that aren't respectable in groups. I'm not sure who's left, but obviously I'm, I'm being a bit flippant, but there, it's the criteria for respectability seems quite high in certain communities. Um, and I think a lot of people are left out of that. So yeah, uh, sociology of childhood has a big part and definitely um, I've been very happy and lucky to contribute to family history which I think is still really important as well um, and Jackie we'll probably end up using a lot. Thanks very much thanks Sarah. Thanks Sarah Anne that was great. Um, are there any more questions? Because if not I'm going to hop in and ask one if I may Sarah Anne. Um, there's, there's so many questions Dan is absolutely right that was my head was flying there with all different sort of ideas but one question that did strike me, and you've just referred to it there actually in your last answer, was this idea of, of the, the multi-generational families and the fact that in, even in my own family, I know of, of, of cousins who lived with the grandmother, you know, and, and, and spent their whole life raised in that sort of a situation. Um, and that's quite common, I think, in, in, in a lot of families. And I'm just wondering, how do those children, do their voices ever come through in, in the narrative? That's, that's the first thing that strikes me. And the, the other thing that, 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 that it's a sort of a double, double part of that is, where does childhood end? Where do you stop being a child? And are you sort of let loose on the world, you know? Um, because I certainly know in my, in my own case, um, both my parents left school at, at 13, 14 and were working at that age. And the thoughts of that now to me is just, unbelievable but like big families as you rightly pointed out you know no secondary no access to free secondary education so they have to work at 13 and 40 whether they like it or not so so there's there's two issues there I suppose where you are in the family which sometimes meant that you ended up with a granny and granddad or somebody else 
and and that idea of where does childhood end where is where are you pushed out of the nest as such any thoughts yeah, on that thanks Jackie like I think with the the first question I, I still think it's so much about where we capture this in the sources um and I always refer to Katrina's work, Katrina Clear's introduction to Women of the House, where she says, like, you take sources from everywhere. It's not that you take, you know, everything that that can tell you, the magazines, the and you also, and I Laura McAtackney's talk and um, recently in in uh, in the NUI Gawai series where she talked about we look, you know, the absence, the silences. And the euphemisms, we have to work with them as historians, I think. And um, when what you're describing there, like I think probably makes sense to, to, to a lot of people um, in regards to, you know, when does it end? And like, again, we are obsessed. We no longer really talk about biology so much. It's very much the big changes, school, work these these are it and you know when I can when it's great with the students today they can hold up their hands and say I'm going to be in youth till my late 20s early 30s because I am dependent and this is the thing it's about dependency as well and it's about I suppose being able to to move on to that next stage in your life course um and that obviously was much earlier but was that and this is where we have to and Hugh Cunningham has a really good article in this about like how we deal with nostalgia in our own childhoods and how we deal with sentimentality and I think that's really difficult for the historian as well how we how we factor that in this is definitely more my talk as to everything we need to do Jackie over the next few months but um these are some of the things yeah I've been considering I do think we have to take what we can we have to you know some moral histories some more we have to do as much as we can and you know a lot of people are still alive thankfully um because our life course has been extended um but we just have to look in some more obscure publications as well i think uh so yeah i i more gave you questions to your question but yeah, I, I think that's that's the strength of your paper. It has posed huge amounts of questions, which, which hopefully a lot of the audience out there will be able to come back to us on when it does come to work. Yes, this come back to us and project. tell us how what they have from there. I suppose I do really think that we need, as it as was the case with the Irish Revolution a few years ago, we need a lot more local micro histories here. Yeah. And that's how we'll weave this together as well. That's cool. Um, and, you know, luckily, genealogy research has exploded and we need to work with our colleagues in genealogy too here because a lot of the, and they are now on private sites and that, but a lot of the records that are available there are really useful as well to the history of childhood. And like, I won't, I didn't even get to go into there, you know, the whole question of the birth register and all that kind of stuff, but there's all these avenues where we can actually do that empirical research as well, or the more kind of quantitative research um, in the kind of, and even marriage, like I think with the marriage record, sometimes if you just put in the age and like even just to challenge what we have now, the age of marriage and how that changes, you know, because that's certainly going to end your childhood experience. So yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Fantastic. Thank you, Sarah Ann. So if, if there are any more questions, we'll happily take them. Um, I think um, Una, just I can see Una. Una, you will, the anthology of childhood, you will be hearing a lot more about <laughs> because um, myself and Jackie are just start, and we'll probably be asking you to contribute and we'll be asking lots of people if they have contributions because we want it to be um, interdisciplinary and we want it to be folklore history art literature the whole lot so yeah this was our coming out party <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly right that's the way to say it thanks for that question una um so if there are no more questions um then can i on your behalf and certainly on my own behalf thanks sarah ann for a really stimulating talk this evening
she stuck to her brief she came in on time she did exactly what she said she did but she did a lot more besides she's she's it was a fantastic lecture and uh i think as as we said earlier on raises a lot of questions for us and things to think about but opening the conversation is a really good start to that so i think she's done that really brilliantly this evening so thank you to dr sarah ann buckley for her talk this evening and um, thanks to Professor Dan Carey uh, from the Moore Institute for allowing us to use the facilities of the Moore once again and for being present as ever and, and asking his enlightened questions as ever uh, for tonight's session. And to David Kelly, Kelly uh, of the Moore Institute also for his technological wizardry, making us all look good and be able to communicate with each other. Um, so thanks to everybody for coming along this evening. Um, this era, it, lecture has been recorded, uh, thanks to Dr. Sarah Ann Buckley giving her permission. So if any of your friends you think might be interested in it, please pass on the, the news that this is going to go live uh, very, very soon. But for the rest of us this evening, it's been a really, really interesting evening to spend uh, in, the, in the company of Dr. Sarah Ann Buckley. And we'd like to thank her very much sincerely on behalf of the society for that. Thanks a million, Sarah Ann. Thanks, Jackie. Night, everyone. Take Good care. Good night, everyone. Thank you.